Well, hello, friends and nonprofit leaders. I have a special treat for you today. I think I say that every week, but that's just because these leaders are so awesome. So today I'm interviewing my first director of development and marketing on this podcast, and I think you're going to love her. Today's guest is Terry Todd. She got her start in a career in advertising and sales at a local newspaper and eventually made her way to being the director of marketing and development at the Children's Protection Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our conversation covers everything from what the organization does to Terry's journey into nonprofit leadership. And we even talk about her new puppy, Bear, or should I say it's her husband's puppy? And he's 70 pounds, but who's counting? (laughs) And then we get into a conversation about a really unique fundraiser that they do every year called Dragon Boat Racing. I hope you'll stay tuned to the end. You're going to love Terry Todd. Hey, have you ever wished you could hear some good news for a change? Well, I might have just what you've been hoping for. Welcome to Your Nonprofit Life, where we remove our rose-colored glasses and explore what leaders are actually doing to move their nonprofits from messy to thriving without burning out in the process. I'm Laura Zelke, Director of Member Experience for the Nonprofit Leadership Lab. Join me each week to explore the ups, downs, and whoopsie daisies of your nonprofit life. Let's get started. Well, Terry, it is so wonderful to have you here on the podcast with me. You are the first development person I've had, so I'm really excited about that. Thank you. I heard that you have a new member in your household. (laughs) I do, I do, but before I chat about him, his name is Bear. I want to first thank you for having me and let you know that I am so appreciative of you and Joan and the whole team there and everything you're doing at the Nonprofit Leadership Lab. I have always been a fan since its inception and just wanted to thank you for this opportunity. And so now on to Bear. Okay, Bear. Um, (laughs) Not a bear though, right? Like you didn't- not a bear. Okay. He's actually a golden doodle. Oh. But he's a black golden doodle. He was one of two black puppies out of his litter. And it was a birthday gift for my husband, who is very, very particular about his types of pets. So Bear's demeanor has been so great. And I had the opportunity to take him to pet daycare today because my husband is working from home due to COVID-19. Right. But the pet daycare is still open. And so I took him this morning, but I usually don't get that privilege because, you know, (laughs) no one can take care of him like the hubs. So, (laughs) Oh my gosh. So a black golden doodle. So they're not called black doodles. No, no. He's got some of that Chesapeake Bay golden retriever in him. Mm. His other sibling that was black is his sister. And she looks more like a poodle and he looks more like a golden retriever. And he's got that demeanor. And that, oh, he just loves everybody and wants to make everybody happy. Do you think it would be okay if we get a picture of him and put it on the show notes page? Absolutely. I just happen to have a few. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I love that, Terry. By this point, I will have given a very brief introduction of what you're doing at the Children's Protection Center. But what I wanted to do is see if you could tell us just kind of an elevator pitch or a little something about the work that your organization does. And then I want to talk about you. Okay. Sounds good. So the Children's Protection Center, which we call CPC, we provide a child-friendly facility where professionals work together to protect and treat child abuse victims and their families, to prevent child abuse in all its forms, and to hold offenders accountable. And currently, CPC is the only organization in our county We are in Arkansas. We're in Pulaski County. That offers a coordinated approach to child abuse. So with the investigation, advocacy services, and educational programs, we have a structured, multidisciplinary approach that includes local law enforcement, DHS workers, prosecutors, state police investigators, medical professionals, and mental health counselors. So all those things are under one roof when a child comes in and needs our services so they don't have to repeat their story. Well, and I know that there's been a trend in child advocacy services for something like this because the children were being re-traumatized, right? Every time they'd have to tell their story to somebody. Correct, correct. So let's say a teacher notices something and talks to that child about it at the school. 
and then they talk to the counselor at the school, and then perhaps the principal, and then they bring in the resource officer or law enforcement, and then the child has to go maybe to a hospital, or then they have to go and talk to somebody else. Well, what we do is we have a team, we call it that multidisciplinary team, it's called MBT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They all are housed in our, under our roof when that child comes in. So we offer that coordination when we know that case is coming in and we can have that child tell their story one time and decrease that trauma. Right. And I think I know the answer to this, but I want to ask just in case there might be someone listening who's not as familiar with it. And the reason I'm familiar is because we just did a fundraising boot camp and one of the guys in there does something similar in Oakland. Oh, good. We were working on his elevator pitch. Good. Um, so when the child comes in and you have all these people, you're not putting that child in a room with all those adults, are you? No, like, what does that look not. like? What absolutely does that look not. Like? Depending on, and it's case specific, but what happens is we have advocates that actually talk to those non-offending family members to let them know what the process is going to be, that this is a safe space for you. You have made the first step to hope and healing and all the things that are going to happen. In the meantime, the child, it's very appropriate and at that age level for the child. And we have interviewers that talk to that child in a manner that makes them feel safe and comfortable as well. And then all those other folks are listening in. And we can also record that so that all the prosecutors and those folks have that information as they need it. So we've got all those folks listening in right. as they are there and probably connected via like we are with headphones and mics right. so that if they need to in that interviewer's ear ask a question or give them some more information to help with the interview process that coordination is still going on right i just think that why did people not think about this before and i'm so glad you know to have an organization like yours and the other person i'll, I'll say it was chad ozias and i'll put a link to his organization as well just on the show notes page because i think it's so important that we think about these things like why were people not doing that before well it's interesting you say that because when i interviewed for my position here i took a tour of the center which was amazing and I told the executive director, I said, I feel happy and sad at the same time. Yeah. I'm sad that abuse exists, but I'm happy that there's a place here that can address that and let people know this is your pathway to getting better, that this mm -hmm. is your path to healing. And sometimes it takes a long time to get justice, mm -hmm. but we don't have to wait on that healing process. We can start that healing process immediately. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of told the executive director, I feel like it's a cross between law and order SVU and judging Amy. So <laughs> for the, I've just dated myself for those of you who do not know what judging Amy is. We are what's known as a child advocacy center, a CAC. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure the other gentleman was a part of a CAC, yeah. but there are so many around the nation and there are 17 in our state. We are very excited. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's life altering because when you think of the experience from a child's experience, or even really from, like you said, a non-offending parent or guardian mm -hmm. that is advocating for the child, that they're not having to make all these trips to different places or having all these strangers interacting with their child. And I think also it helps probably for some consistency as well. Right. You think with the story? Mm -hmm. I'm a mom. And mm -hmm. if the offender was in my home, what am I going to do? Because I would have to pick up and move to protect my child. And so that's the uniqueness of the approach is because the advocates are there to give these resources to these folks that need to do those kind of things. Immediate relocation. Really? It may be so traumatic that you need to leave immediately and you're leaving with just everything that you have. So we have those resources, if not in the center with our partners to get you housing for groceries, you know, underwear, a toothbrush. Right. <laughs> you know, those are the kind of things that people don't think about. But the work that we do is always to, the response is always to place the welfare of the child first. So in every move that we make, we are thinking about the welfare of the child. And so that's really what the advocates, when they speak with those parents or those caregivers that are in here and probably traumatize themselves, like, oh my God, this is going on. Right. We're talking to them about, okay, so let's put the welfare of your child first. And then these are the things we can do to help you move the whole unit to a better space. Right. Right. Wow. So here you are. It's <laughs> 2020. 
And yes. my question to you is, how did you come into this career? So you're the development and marketing director. How did you come into that position? And did you ever imagine when you were younger, you know, I want to grow up and I'm going to be a fundraiser for <laughs> nonprofit organizations because number one, job security, because nonprofits never have enough money. And, you know, what was it that took you on that journey and, and how did you end up where you're at? You know, it's so funny that you have a plan and then things happen and God moves you into different spaces. Because always growing up, I was the valedictorian of my class. I was the top student. I wanted wow. to work in some industry with computers because that was what was happening when I graduated. And my scholarship in undergraduate degree is in computer information systems. Okay. And what I soon found out in college was that I absolutely hated everything about programming computers. <laughs> absolutely hated it. I could not, did not have the personality for it. Could not stand it. Knew I was going to flop at it. But I took a lot of marketing and advertising and finance and accounting classes and just happened to fall into a part-time job at the newspaper at the city where I was going to college. And that grew into an advertising career. Okay. And then I worked at the state's newspaper in advertising. And you get a lot of marketing with the advertising skills. Sure. If you have a good mentor. And after I had my son, my perspective changed. And I didn't want to have to fight with revenue and all that kind of stuff that had to go on with sales. I jumped into the nonprofit sector with the Girl Scout. Okay. I became the PR director at local Girl Scout Council and absolutely loved it. But then jumped out and went back to advertising really quickly, but realized that I needed to be back in nonprofit. Yeah. I grew up with my parents instilling service in us. And at the time, I, I did not know that's what was happening. But it was always we did things for other people. We joined mm. organizations. We supported organizations. And then in my heart, it's intrinsic. And I am driven by missions that help people and help make the world better. So I did my graduate work in community and economic development, knowing that I wanted to do something that would make communities stronger. And what is at the very essence of your community but the families. Right. So here I am. And I just happened that this job, I came and interviewed. And absolutely loved it. Our address is 1210 Wolf Street, and we call ourselves the Wolf Pack. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Because we are fierce advocates. But I couldn't ask for a better group of coworkers, a better boss, a better board of directors. I mean, this, this nonprofit has gotten it right with the board. It's just an amazing journey, and I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm excited for you, and I know that you've been with the lab for a while. So I remember your job transition where you were yes. at one organization and then you moved over here. So I'm really curious, how did you get in development? Like, so. <laughs> well, see, I mean, I know advertising and marketing, yeah. like it all kind of goes together and it seems like a perfect match. Well, and as most people who are listening, who are probably parts of nonprofits, you know that folks have to wear multiple hats multiple times. Right. And it kind of fell up under my area of responsibility when I was at the Girl Scouts. One, I was in charge of the cookie sale, which isn't really development, but there were things surrounding that sale that had to do with development. And at the time, the development director there was retiring and we had an interim executive director who talked to me, cultivated my strengths, shared with me what we could improve on. And then I was like, hey, you know, I really like going out and advocating for the work that we do and getting people excited about it so that mm -hmm. they want to support us. And it wasn't necessarily raising the money, but it was developing the relationships that I knew would over time magnify what they could do for us. So it, it wasn't just getting that check from that organization or that donor or that company. It was also them believing in our mission and what we did and being able to articulate that and bring in their colleagues and peers because that strengthened what we were doing. Wow. So it kind of seems like you were made to do this. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. And then even when I, my other organization that I worked with for 12 years, it's so funny. I started out assisting the executive director and it was a very small staff. And one of his charges was fundraising. And he was like, I have to be honest with you. I am lost here. I need your help. And then the board and he realized, I guess you could call it my gifts. Mm -hmm. It grew into, I had a bunch of different job title names. And I was like, you can call me janitor. I don't even care what you call me. 
I'll do what you need me to do. And it ended up being most of that development and marketing piece because it goes hand in hand. And because we were a small staff, I took on that role. Right. So how long have you been at the Children's Protection Center? It will be my one year anniversary on June the 10th. I was hired the week of the major fundraising event, which was quite an introduction, I must say, but it was fabulous. And it has just been a wonderful whirlwind since then. Are you serious it's been a wonderful whirlwind since then? Or would you say that it's been like a tornado the last month? (laughs) Well, it's interesting that you say that because before I talk about development, I also want to make a point that during COVID-19, some of the things that people don't think about, just like people don't think about that some kids only get a hot meal or their meals of the day at school. Mm -hmm. So they're filling in that gap with meals. Mm -hmm. A lot of times being at home should be a safe place to seek protection from COVID-19, but it can be a dangerous place for children who are victims of abuse. And so most of our child abuse experts agree that once COVID-19 passes, that the cases, the number of reported cases are going to surge because those folks that would normally recognize that are not seeing these children every day. And so we are, during this month, which is Child Abuse Prevention Month, we are encouraging folks to be attentive to children that may come in the grocery store, they may see children out in their neighborhood to help report that suspected abuse or neglect. And so we have just been rolling with the punches here. Our doors are open because even during a lockdown, our doors are open because abuse never stops. And so we have just made adjustments. We are considered essential. We have partnered with our local hospital, Arkansas Children's Hospital. So they donate our space and we are considered essential staff. So we get screened every day and we are here for child abuse victims. And matter of fact, we had a day full yesterday of cases and we can be available on call as needed as well. Wow. Yeah, I was just interviewing someone last week, Shaney Starr. Her podcast is actually going live today, the day that you and I are recording, and then yours is going to go live next week. And she was saying the same thing. She's a CASA Mm -hmm. organization and just the concern for the children and for neighbors to keep an eye out. Yes. It's like you said, you think about the food because that's something that kind of makes the news, right? Mm -hmm. That the children who eat at school aren't getting the food, you know, how are we doing that? So there's all this focus on all the things that are being done to provide for the nutrition, but then there's not really anything in the news that I've seen where they're talking about the abuse and neglect that can happen. And that's not being caught because of them being at home. Right. It is really, really hard. In the time now that you're in COVID, so I'm curious because you're the first development director that I have had on the podcast. And I'm curious, as you're looking at the rest of 2020, There's this new Giving Tuesday thing that's happening on May 5th. Maybe there was a gala or something like that coming up. Have you thought about what you're going to do as far as shifting? Do you get your funds from grants or do you get your funds from donors? Like, how are you guys set up that way? We actually do. We have a couple of events that were scheduled that we postponed. The first event we postponed because of the weather. We postponed it from the end of March, I'm sorry, the middle of March to the middle of April. It was a smaller fundraising event that netted about Mm $10,000. And when we shared with our sponsors and participants and guests that we were moving it initially because of the weather, and then we let them know again, we are because of COVID-19 and all the instructions that we and guidance we've been giving, we're just going to postpone it until we can have it at a later date. And they were all totally okay with it. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, they were saying just our money is going to be our support regardless. So we are in a holding pattern for that. But our major fundraiser is an outdoor event. It's a dragon boat race. And that is scheduled for June the 19th and the 20th. And we have tentatively kept that as it should be. Mm -hmm. But we have made plans with the organization that helps us put that on. And we've also alerted our donors and the teams. And all the folks that are stakeholders within that event, that should we move it, we'll let you know as soon as we can. And here are the tentative dates. And everybody is so, they have been overwhelmingly supportive. And I tell my executive director before I joined this organization back in the day, about 12 years ago, 
they only had three staff members and they were really, really worried about their image and they wanted to be perceived as a resource in Pulaski County for all the law enforcement, all the folks that were working with these abused and neglected children. And I tell them all the time that they are rock stars because they have made my job easy because the board and the people who are supporting us are not in it as I just want to support this event. I want to support the work you do. Mm. And one of the unique things is the sponsors for this event. We have gotten almost all the sponsor revenue. Everybody's already paid everything. And they're just like, what can we do for you now? We know that's coming up later, but what can we do for you now? And that really gives you an incentive to work harder and to make sure that you are being fiscally responsible and programmatically responsible for these folks that are really supporting you. This is relationship-based. They are about the work that we do and not about something that makes their company look good. They want to be a part of this movement that we're doing and the impact we have. Right. And with the children that you're serving and the families in your community, I think the work is so important. It's easy for the community to get behind it. And I wonder sometimes, you know, do you find other nonprofits are jealous? I would be jealous if I was still at my former position because it was a different dynamic. The national office that I worked for didn't actually provide hands-on service. So when you asked for support, most folks wanted to see where their money was going. And it was an explanation as to here's what's going to happen. Right. It was a little bit challenging to make that connection. But once you made it, it was okay. But I still say the foundational relationship and community support, there was still going to be some work to be done there. Mm -hmm. And this group has really done a good job of establishing that this is the organization that you come to for this problem. This is the need. And here we are, the experts for this problem. And so we are top of mind with that MDT group. We are top of mind with healthcare workers and all that circle of people. They trust us. And then with that trust, they know that the money that they are giving, any kind of support that they give to us is going to go to that bottom line of putting the needs of the child first. Oh, let me ask you this then. Do you think that part of the reason that you are so top of mind with the professionals community is because you said the hospital is donating your space? Mm -hmm. So are you on hospital premises? Yes, we are on hospital premises. But before it was in a freestanding, what used to be a house. And then this building was built with the idea of housing all these entities together with the Children's Protection Center. And so it's called the Clark Center for Safe and Healthy Children. But a lot of people, it was two blocks from where I used to work and I knew it was here and I kind of knew it was for kids and kind of knew it was if kids needed a safe space, but I had no idea what was going on in this building. I had no idea that all the superheroes were housed in this building (laughs) (laughs) until I came over here and I was like, oh my God. And that's usually what happens when we give a tour of the building and talk about the work that we do. Right. You can see the light bulb go off and people are like, oh my, okay, this is fantastic. How can I be involved? Can I volunteer? What can I do? Yeah. So part of your job is marketing as well, right? You're marketing and development. And so how are you getting the message of what you've got to people who maybe aren't coming and taking a tour of your building? We find that we get a lot of engagement on social media, Mm -hmm. but also our multidisciplinary team partners help us get that word out too. And we also have advocates that go out into the community and do some outreach for us. We have one specifically that goes into the schools and talks about safety with the children. Internet safety and body safety, it's very appropriate. We get the buy-in from the school district and the individual schools and principals and counselors first. Mm -hmm. And that helps spread that word as well. And then those children also may go home and say, these are my five trusted people or this is my safe space. And that helps get that awareness out. But that is primarily what we do. And then through these events, which are so polar opposite, we have one, two, three events a year. One event is a disc golf tournament. Disc golf? 
it's like a frisbee. Please, disc golfers, don't get mad at me. <laughs> disc golfers get mad if you call it a frisbee. But it's like a frisbee that you throw into a chain on a course, mm-hmm. like a golf course with, with, with frisbee. But we have a local radio personality that loves that and is part of this disc golf movement. And that nets about $10,000. He's on our board and he is the event chair. Then we have a protector shootout, which is a sporting clays tournament because we have a couple of board members that like to shoot clay and that nets about $10,000 and that brings a different group. And then the Dragon Boat Festival, because when I got hired, I asked my prospective ED, I said, what, help me, what, what is this? What's happening? How does that connect? And that is typically attended by about 3,500 people and raises between 130 and $160,000. Wow. And what is a dragon boat? I'm sorry, but I, I just have never heard of a dragon boat. <laughs> I'm imagining boats shaped like dragons. And that is what it is. Okay. And I believe the tip, and forgive me, listeners out there, if I don't get the (laughs) history exactly correct, but it started in China, Japan. It's, there's a Chinese dragon boat festival. Right. Okay. That they typically have, I believe in February. Okay. And this is a festival that we have. There's a crew called Dynamic Dragon that they bring all the crew that teaches you a professional coach. The boats come and you get teams of 20 and a drummer. And then your teams row in heats. Oh, in these are like actual boats. Like these I'm imagining. So here in North Carolina, they do like a rubber ducky sail, yes. right? Like that. Yeah. And so I was thinking little dragon boats, but these are actual boats. These are that, t- boats with 20 people in them. And you, pra- you have a professional coach that t- you practice with. And I jumped on the boat last year, all green and new. But it is addictive and people love it. And the beauty of the event is it's a two-day event and it's like a huge tailgate party that first day because the teams come in, they set up their tents, they get their teams together. A lot of them use it for team building or networking for their organizations. Sure. A lot of them do it as employee and staff appreciation. So they bring their families out and it is just at this wonderful lake and it is just beautiful and the folks are having a blast. And they race those dragon boats and they get kind of (laughs) competitive. Yeah, it becomes kind of competitive. But what each team does, there's a registration fee for each boat. Uh And then we have sponsors that sponsor different sponsor packages. But then those teams also raise pledges. We ask every team member to raise $100 in pledges. Okay. And they have a unique link that they can use that way. Organizations do different things at their offices to raise money, like throw a pie in their boss's face or pay five dollars to wear blue jeans and they come up with some different interesting things according to their culture of their organization <laughs> I bet, I bet. But it's really a fun event and what we're our messaging to our sponsors and teams is that once COVID-19 has passed I'm sure we'll all want to get out and have some fun right. and just soak in the sun and so everybody has been like yes we're waiting we're set on go yeah we're having virtual captains meetings and in hopes that we can keep that date. But even if we can't, we're still going to keep them engaged. So we've been keeping everybody engaged virtually. Well, I'm really impressed. You know, it is really something to watch the nonprofit sector pivot. And I know like the words of the year are going to be COVID pivot virtual, (laughs) right? Yes. Yes. That I mean, I know the the words are being overused right now, but it really, I mean, what else are you going to say? That is what is happening evolving. Right. What I see is rather than stick your head in the sand and wait for everything to pass and then come back out and keep doing things the same way, the nonprofits that are going to make it are the ones that are pivoting, hunkering down, doing what you're doing. Like, okay, well, we're still going to plan, but you're not waiting until you have a green light to have your captain's meetings. You're like, let's just do them virtually. Let's figure this out. And I think that with that kind of ability to just make the necessary changes to keep your people engaged, I have heard you say it over and over again in this interview, is keeping the donors engaged, the board is engaged, your people are engaged, you're trying to engage the community that engage, engage, engage. That's what you do as a development director. Right. Mm -hmm. Like your development and marketing, your goal is to make sure that message is clear, crystal clear. You're out there and you're giving your people what they need so that they're still engaged and you're not falling off the radar. Like you said, you're top of mind. 
And that's key. And also, I know that I've seen the posts in the members only section of the lab, and my heart aches and goes out to those nonprofit executives where they're fighting with their board because their board's panicking and the board's sending a different message than what they're sending, or they may have some staff members Mm -hmm. that are doing the same thing. And one of the wonderful things that has come out of this for us is that the message has been consistent through the board, the staff, our MDT partners. It has been a message of positivity, even though we're going through these trying times. And sometimes I think that can be a struggle if COVID-19 wasn't going on. Yeah. And when I talked about how this board and this organization got it right with the board mix and the board support and the board's role with the executive director, they did. They got it right. The puzzle pieces fit together. And it's so important to always evolve and pivot not just doing COVID-19, but as a nonprofit, you have to be ready to do that anyway, all the time. That's It's true. just forcing us to do it right now in a way that you may not be comfortable or on a schedule. Right. Two things I want to touch on. One is I just wanted to affirm the fact that you have board members who have these really, I don't want to say unique, but just specific hobbies that they're really into. Like, <laughs> disc golf or clay shooting and clay shooting. And you have empowered them to do fundraisers and stuff that they love. I mean, how awesome is that? I actually have not heard a lot of that, you know, and I know Joan teaches that when you are building your board, don't just have them there for governance. Like, right. They're coming with skills. They're coming with interests. They're coming with hobbies. They're coming with stuff they do. And if you are not engaging them in that, you are really missing out because not only does it give them the opportunity to do something that they really enjoy, like you said, it's bringing in their contacts and it's a different pool, right, for each group and they're able to raise money and it just solidifies maybe their engagement in the organization itself. And then the other thing, Terry, I just want to mention this real quick, that The consistency in messaging, how did you accomplish that? When I came here, uh, the first thing I did was I wrote a communications plan and I wrote a resource development plan. And within those two things, I must admit that I had already cheated a little bit because I had been part of the nonprofit leadership lab since its inception. And we had the opportunity with my other organization of having Joan come and speak to our board and do a workshop. And so some of those things I had already had in development in my little personal file of dreaming big. And when I started that, the organization gave me the platform to present that and share that, starting with the staff and the board. And it intersected with a time when we were actually developing a new strategic plan as well. And so we built that into the strategic plan. And part of that communications plan was training for the board and the staff and our MDT partners to talk about that consistent messaging and what our messaging was going to be. And so it was like a little training snippet. And we really talked about, this is what the issue is. This is what the task is. This is what our approach is. And this is our message. And so everybody has bought into that and actually supported that and been that way. One of the things I wanted to go back and touch on when you talked about the board members and keeping them engaged I also started out at my very first board meeting telling the board members, even though you feel like you may not have any resources, you have unique resources that you can give to this organization, whether it's the people you know, whether it's where you work, whether it's a hobby you have, you have some resources that you can give to this organization. We just need to figure out what those are. And we have, of of course, the work that we do weighs heavy emotionally on the staff. And so there can be some really tough days when you talked about today may have been one of those days where you have to reset. Mm -hmm. And we have board members that all often ask, how's the staff doing? That was a really hard case. How are they coping with that? How are they doing? So we have a couple of board members that are actually therapists. So what they did was they donated a therapist from their group to come and talk to the staff. So we call that our processing group so that we can talk about those hard cases and how we are exercising self-care and doing those things that we need to do. So that was a special resource that they may not have thought about otherwise. That was a gift they could give to us. Right. And that's invaluable as well. 
So I kept telling them resources are not always money. Right. I hope that people are listening to this because when you are on a board and you have the opportunity to give something, whether it be sharing a therapist from your practice so that people can have a place to process what they're dealing with, or, you know, throwing a fundraiser with your favorite hobby, that it is so fulfilling for the board member. It just like solidifies that relationship in that not only are they offering their brains, and it's not to say that some people that isn't their biggest gift is offering their right. brains, right? Because we do have those members where we do need their brains right. and their expert and expertise. the strategic yes. and, and all of that. But that you can engage people in different ways and the synergy that happens with the group and the team. And the camaraderie within the board itself, I think, as well, develops through experiences like that when they're all kind of pitching in. And, you know, it's like you start realizing we really are able to accomplish a lot together. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things I did also when I first got here was I did a three-year analysis of the budget and the revenue all those things. And at my first board meeting, I said, you guys should be amazed at the work that you have done. Mm -hmm. Because if you look three years ago as to where you are now with your fundraising revenue, and then just your bottom line in general, and then you've increased your services to these children and families, it has been nothing short of amazing. And I think seeing that in writing helped also with that synergy and them feeling empowered that, you know, we are making a difference. Mm -hmm. When we set policy, when we do this, when we do that, all these efforts are making a difference. The Dragon Boat Festival has been an amazing event, and this is going to be its eighth year, I believe. But what we did was we regrouped and we changed the sponsorship packages, and then we also offered customized packages to sponsors. So we really had conversations with people who had been sponsoring the event and to find out what got their juices going, what really Mm -hmm. made them excited. Mm -hmm. And we maybe changed the name of the package and then did some other things in that package that were specific to that organization. And we called them customized sponsorships as opposed to gold, platinum, silver, Mm -hmm. what have you. And that has been received really, really well. I mean, like we had sponsors calling and saying, has this package been taken yet? Because I wanted to do this. Wow. That was, that, was a, that was a fun thing to do. I was going to gonna say, you know, when you have sponsors calling you saying, <laughs> I want this one, can you give me an example of like what one of the customized packages might have looked like? So a couple of things. We have a new sponsor. Well, actually, they weren't new. They were a current sponsor. Okay. But what I did was I took the package and changed the name of it and amped it up a little bit and called it Dragon Boat Alley. Okay. And highlighted that with their signage and with them being the Dragon Boat Alley sponsor, that all the people getting on the boat were going to see this and do that and experience this and all that good stuff. So they immediately emailed back and said, has this sponsorship been taken? And we were excited to do that. Right. We have a alcoholic beverage distributor who has a product that they really wanted to promote. They had some new marketing dollars to promote that. So we came up with the Dragon Pub. And so that's going to be a specific area that is meeting all the criteria where you are going to be ID'd and get a wristband and all that good stuff. But we came up with the Dragon Pub and he was overjoyed with that. And he has some things he's going to bring to the table with that. And then we had things that we also offered with that, which just made, and it's a new element for the event. And so that's going to be very exciting. And then we have a long-term sponsor, one of those sponsors that it's a bank. And they actually use this as their employee appreciation event to bring their family. We noticed that last year, all the kids that were coming, all the staff of theirs that was coming, the different things they were trying to do that day. So what we did was we incorporated a few more things, gave them some other options, and it doubled their sponsorship amount. Wow. Wow. So it was very exciting when we presented that to them. So do you do like a... I was going to say an exit survey, but it's not really an exit survey, but you're doing some kind of follow-up with your sponsors after the event to find out, like you said, what gets the juices flowing, what gets them excited. And then as you're planning your next event, then you're trying to incorporate that into your sponsorships. 
I just, yeah, I think that's brilliant. I'm a big fan of debriefing, of debriefing uh -huh. everybody yep. from, if you can even debrief the guests that come in, also the staff and the volunteers and your sponsors, because on top of the good stuff, you want to know what the challenges were too. Right. Because number one, you want to address those challenges and acknowledge them to make sure everybody is heard and then take those steps to improve on it. Right. And that is what helps strengthen that relationship and makes people feel that like valuable and that the money that they are giving, the time that they are giving is valuable and that you are understanding what's happening. Right. And then how do you communicate back to the people who participated at whatever level, how much money you raised? Like, do you share how much money you raised? Do you tell them what you're doing with that money after the event? We actually do. We have some initiatives, our wish list initiatives, mm -hmm. or we may expand in initiatives, have uh, ideas of expanding some current programs and initiatives. And we have a separate social media platform for the Dragon Boat Festival where we actually share that okay. with the Dragon Boat and the Dragon Boat folk. But also we try to make a good effort too on Facebook and in our uh, donor newsletter and in our quarterly newsletter to share how much we've made, how much we've netted. Because of this event, we raised this money and it's going to help us do this, mm -hmm. accomplish this. Mm -hmm. So we constantly try to share that. We have a campaign we're going to try to launch at the time of Dragon Boat. And I'm trying to think of a unique way for my executive director like to launch her on a boat to, <laughs> to kind of... <laughs> Kind of demonstrate that we're launching this 15 year campaign. Uh -huh. But this is a campaign that in three years we will be 15 years old. And we want to encourage multi year giving over this three years to raise a certain amount of money. Uh -huh. And we really want to talk to our top donors and even other folks who have been consistent supporters about what their philanthropic goal is with CPC. And then we have all these options. And I'm going to use the word again, customizable options, ways for you to support our work. Well, sure. So that even if your organization, you may be our strongest supporter at your organization and you leave and the organization's next person doesn't understand what you were doing. We have an agreement in place and that gives us an introduction to the new person to say, so this is why this agreement was signed. And, right. and we have a foundation for that instead of going back to this donor year after year. And even your strongest supporters can experience donor fatigue. Mm -hmm. So this is a way that they know that their plan is in place and they can feel comfortable and excited about supporting our work. And it aligns with our new strategic plan. Yeah. And everything is customizable these days. So it just right. makes sense. I think people are used to that option. And when you have a business that you're supporting a nonprofit and you can customize that, that just makes sense to me. It makes it yes. more attractive. So I know we've been going on for a while and we <laughs> got to wrap it up. I hate to end the conversation because this has been so good, but let me ask you, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you, with your organization, if they want more information about Children's Protection Center? if they want to get in touch with you. What I've been doing on the show notes page is just LinkedIn, putting that up there. But what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and your organization? Of course, the website, which is childrensprotectioncenter.org, always on Facebook, just search for Children's Protection Center Little Rock. On Twitter, we're at CPC Little Rock. And on Instagram, we're at CPC underscore Little Rock. And then my email address is ttodd at childrensprotectioncenter.org. But you can find all that good stuff on our website. That would be the first place I would tell folks to go. Okay, great. Well, I just can't thank you enough for your candor, your energy, just <laughs> sharing so generously all your ideas for development. And you just have such a beautiful heart for the children and for the work that you're doing. Also, I have to say it's so nice to hear someone who is just having a wonderful experience with their board. Like you said, we've seen there are some boards that are just more in panic mode than in planning mode. The pivot has not happened and it's really putting the nonprofit in kind of an existential crisis. And so to hear how your board has handled things and how you are just really taking the time to get strategic with it and 
keep people informed and engaged. And you're doing that through social media and you're doing that through your partners. I just think it's wonderful. So thank you so much for giving me this gift of your time. I know it's just a really hectic time right now. So thank you. Thank you. You You are most welcome. Wonderful. And I'll see you in the village. Thanks for listening. To access the show notes or share feedback on this podcast and link over to our socials, visit our website at yournonprofitlife.com. That's yournonprofitlife.com. And hey, if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you're going to love The Village. It's our exclusive online community where we take what we're learning in the Nonprofit Leadership Lab and apply it. We take it to the next level with live Q&As, boot camps, online book clubs, and legit support from experts committed to helping you extend your nonprofit life. By the way, Since we're just getting started, it would mean the world to us if you'd subscribe to the podcast and leave a great review on iTunes. The reviews will help us get the podcast in front of more people as we try to take the whole sector from messy to thriving. See you next time.